put me in this section, <laughs> since I'm talking about pain. Um, but we'll try to get to the happiness. So I'm here to celebrate, this is my 25th anniversary of living with chronic pain. And I'm not saying that because I like it, but because it's enabled me to work with some incredible people and doing what I really love to do. So many of you in the audience have chronic pain probably because the conservative estimates are that one in five people in industrialized countries has chronic pain. Now, I'm not talking about a symptom. I'm talking about a systemic degenerative disease. And what happens is your pain response system, for whatever reason, goes berserk and it stays stuck at a really high level. Um, so, invariably, when I meet someone and I tell them I have chronic pain, I hear this. Have you tried? <laughs> yes, I have. All of it. And I put that slide there because I think it's really important to know that it's a really complex, serious disease. And any one cure isn't going to do it. It's a relatively uh, newly identified disease, the cause isn't known, the cure isn't known, and um, it's called the Wild West of Medicine. Uh, but the good thing is that means that there's some amazing doctors that I work with. So what I'm here to tell you is a story about how a childhood obsession persists and becomes a career and a lifestyle. So I haven't been in good health since the day I was born. And you know when you're little and you're awake during surgery in a teaching hospital and you see your insides projected on a really large screen, it can, you know, help you develop some really hardcore obsessions. <laughs> so my obsessions are with life and death and the inner goings on. So what happens inside? So how does that manifest? Well. The first thing is, since I've been eight years old, I've been taking pictures of roadkill. And I'm not going to make these really large, but I always dreamed of having these massive photos of roadkill. Because to me, it's really magic that you have this flat piece of paper, and you look at it, and it evokes this really intense visceral response. Like, that's crazy, right? And I've been taking pictures ever since. And those obsessions persisted throughout my degrees in interactive art and computer science. How, you may ask. Um, one of the ways it did was when I was working at Apple Computer back in the day in the 80s, um, I was lucky enough to work on HyperCard, and it was my job to figure out, to dream about what people might use the first multimedia application for. Like, how cool is that? And while everyone was talking about the multiple media, I kept saying, but what about the multiple senses? Like, how does that work? How do you juggle those? So I was interested still in the inner sensations that that multimedia application could provoke. And later, I designed a typeface or a font that is integrated with um, biofeedback. So it's continually moving according to what your physiological states are doing. So in this example, um, you see some of the letters are large. So they're constantly moving or animating according to, in this case, your brain waves, or in this case, your galvanic skin response. So our skin is kind of our body's mood ring, as it were. And in this case, both GSR and breath rate. So as you breathe, the font breathes. And later, I developed an interactive meat book. Yep, it's a book made of meat. And it's interactive, so if you approach it in a really threatening way, it quivers, right? Um, but if you're gentle and you approach it slowly, it makes better movements. 
Um, and both of those things, so the theories are that um, our dependence on language and on books have ripped us away from a more primordial connection to many of our senses, including our inner senses. That's why the meat book. And I didn't expect a lot of people to use it and turn the pages, and they do, with or without protection. <laughs> so you might be saying, okay, Diane, why are you <laughs> creating this work? Um, because the, it evokes inner sensations, and um, I always am obsessed with trying to figure out how does that work? Um, and so in 1991, I was lucky enough to be one of the first artists to get my hands on immersive virtual reality. How many of you have had a VR experience? A couple? Okay. So what that is, um, it usually involves stereoscopic, um, in this case, you know, two little cameras uh, that show you a 3D image and spatialized sound and the big difference is instead of looking at a computer screen, you feel like you're in the simulation itself. And when you interact with something, it interacts with you. And so the environment I had, because I spent so, such an investment of my money in the medical system and medical data, I have been gathering it for many years. So I had an MRI of my torso, and I thought that would be great to be immersed in that. Um, and so uh, I texture mapped the, the bones and the organs, and they're continually moving as you fly around in that space. So you, that's what you first see. So it feels like the body's this big. And when you go into smaller organs, these larger surreal worlds unfolded. What I learned from this is that when you have something with no rectilinear edges, you have this really strange sense. It's called proprioception, and it's the sense of where you are in your body. And we usually take that for granted. And what's going on is there's a sensory conflict. So some of your senses are saying, hey, this is really cool. Six degrees of freedom, I get to fly everywhere. And the rest of your body is saying, wait a minute, I can feel gravity. So that kind of conflict produces these unusual sensations that you could liken to a trip without a suitcase. Um, <laughs> and then I thought, OK, so what if I go to bio, back to biofeedback and I integrate that with virtual environments? Because it seemed to me that what I was feeling flying around in my torso felt so much like what it was for me to meditate. So I thought, okay, what about virtual reality and meditation? So um, a group of us designed, this is called the meditation chamber, what the users seeing is a jellyfish, and as you breathe, the jellyfish moves. And as your stress levels go down, the jellyfish dissolves to nothingness and because the challenge was that when you're looking at something, your attention is pulled outward. But the design challenge is to design something so that uh, your focus goes inward. And so it changes here from visual to auditory. Um, and again, so from the exteroceptive senses, the five senses, to our inner senses. Now, here's the really bizarre thing. We have 100,000 times more inner sensors than our five senses. 100,000 times more. But the thing is, they're usually quiet, right? It would overtake our consciousness if we could pay attention to all of it. But we can learn how to access some of those and use them. For example, in meditation. So um, virtual reality, it turns out, is effective in relieving short-term pain. You know, the sensation I was talking about that was in conflict felt to me kind of like a drug trip. And indeed, it turns out that VR is effective. In fact, um, almost as effective as opioids, which humans have been using for 7,000 years. 
That's crazy too, I think, that a media form can relieve pain to that degree is amazing. And it's so effective that it's termed a non-pharmacological analgesic. And we think it works because you're so intensely distracted. But if you have chronic pain, you can't be distracted every day, all day. So I had to develop a new paradigm. So I found um, the best physicians, computer scientists, neuroscientists, designers, uh, media people, animators, and so forth, and formed a research group. And we combined virtual reality with mindfulness, meditation, and biofeedback. Now, these two things we know work from decades of research. We know that biofeedback and mindfulness meditation is effective for relieving or at least dealing with chronic pain. <clears throat> You're saying technology and meditation? Of course, you don't need it, but the one thing it does allow for is um, real-time feedback, so you know if you're actually getting somewhere if you're new to meditation. So if you look at the sky here, you'll see that the closer you get to what we think is a meditative state, the more the sky clears. And uh, what happens, too, is that the sound becomes more three-dimensional. Um, and we have different forms. We have a walking version, we have a sitting version, we have a suspended version that's totally sonic, and uh, the sound circles you and goes up. So I think what happens is VR works as a mirror for our inner senses. It enables awareness and it helps us focus inward. And beyond VR, I'm exploring this with robotics, in a similar way, this is hooked up to biofeedback, so this breathes as you breathe, its heartbeat as your heart beats, and when you pet it, it purrs and wiggles its ears. And in alternative, more artistic virtual environments, um, in this case, this is with fiber optics, and that encourages movement because people who have chronic pain often have kinesophobia or fear of moving. And what's important about working with the people I work with is that the knowledge from medicine and art and neuroscience and computer science and especially traditional practices all have something to tell us about how our inner states and sensations work. But at the same time, pain really mm, challenges the very tenets of all of those disciplines. So I think it's really, really interesting. There's no quick cure. And what I'd like you to think about is the ways in which our wet inner world, these enormous universes within, can be tapped for curative purposes. And that's the idea that I think is worth spreading. Thanks.